Good evening, everybody. Um, I am pleased to welcome you all to the Samuel Newton Distinguished Visiting Scholar Lecture. This is something we've done every year at City College for years and years and years, and, and, and we're proud to continue the tradition tonight. Um, I'd like to say a couple things, uh, first about this lecture and then about our, our, our guest speaker. Um, some of you know that before I came into the position as interim president of City College, I was the, first the director of the Colin Powell Center and then the dean of the Colin Powell School. And this year we're celebrating the 40th, and the Colin Powell School is where the social sciences take place at City College. And this year we're celebrating the 40th anniversary of the formation of the social sciences as a separate entity on campus. And as, as we thought about that, one of the things we did is we went back into the archive to look at what was happening 40 years ago to motivate the founding of a separate entity, the social sciences. And it was the crisis of New York City. You know, at a time when New York City was in serious, serious trouble, the economists decided they needed a separate unit so they could speak to the economic future of the city. And the political scientists thought they needed to set, stand apart and talk about politics. And the sociologists thought they needed a separate unit to talk about the social problems in the city. And so from that thinking, in a moment of crisis, as an effort to serve the city of New York in its time of need, the City College of New York founded a separate entity called the Social Science Division. And I, and I say that tonight because if you go back to those days, as we have over the course of this year with various lectures and programs, one of the things you find is that New York City was in a very real way rescued by a very small number of, of, of people. People who loved the city, people who believed in public investment, people who believed that in its time of need, its sons and daughters should step forward to, to defend it. That's something that we say every year at graduation as part of the Ephibic Oath. We charge our students with defending the city. And it's something that, that um, Jack Rudin deeply, deeply believed in, the Rudin family believed in deeply. Um, Sammy Rudin, Jack Rudin, um, together with, a, as I say, a very small group of men and women, literally saved the city of New York when it was teetered on the verge of bankruptcy. Um, the Rudin, uh, Jack Rudin was the first investor in this enterprise that mattered so much to me, the Colin Powell Center. And, and he has, through various foundations over the years, steadily invested in lectures like this lecture, spaces like our exhibit space. Um, he did at City College what he did all of his life in the city of New York, which is use his leadership and insight and wisdom and philanthropic support to make it a better place. And I say this particularly this year because we lost Mr. Rudin last November. And um, you know, every time we've done our, a Rudin lecture, when he was able, he would come in the years, in the later years when he wasn't able, he would send you know, members of his foundation, we have members of his foundation here, we thank you for, for being here with us tonight. But on this year in particular, um, I would like us just to take a second and remember the legacy of Jack Rudin as it is expressed at City College, both here and in the other great investments that he's done. So tonight, we are really lucky to have Vivek Tuari with us to, to talk about this really kind of extraordinary graphic novel that he's written about Brian Epstein, The, the, the Fifth Beetle. Um, and in preparing for this, I had a chance to, to, to look at the graphic novel. It is absolutely beautiful. You'll have a chance to see it and purchase it and have it signed <laughs> later on up in a reception that will immediately follow up in Shepherd 250. But you know, Vivek's career is, it, it, it's, it's kind of extraordinary. He works across all media. He's been deeply influenced by music. But what he does with music, with music that moves him, is he takes it from the album or the concert hall or the recording and he brings it in other spaces. So you 
certainly know of the Broadway production of Green Day's American Idiot. This is Vivek's um, brainchild. He's currently working on a similar adaptation of um, Alinus Morissette's uh, debut album, um, The Rugged Pill? Jagged Little Pill. Jagged Little Pill. <laughs> <laughs> but he has he has an imagination to take things from the musical world into other media. We see that today in, 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 the, in the Brian Epstein book, uh, the story of the fifth beetle. And, and, and it's, I'll let him tell the story of the book, but it's a, it, it's, it's a kind of extraordinary story, both of somebody who desperately wants to be part of something that he sees unfolding in front of him, in part because he is in a number of ways excluded. He is. Uh, a, a gay man in England when it was a crime. He is uh, a, a Jewish man at a time when that meant that you were probably excluded. He was from the city of Liverpool at a time when that was in some ways excluded from the main social and economic currents of, of England. Um, but it's also a story about, about music, about, about you know, discovering something that's beautiful and inspiring and wanting to be a part of it. And, and, and this is really what you see in, uh, across his, his work. I, 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 can, I can list it all for you, but suffice it to say is that he, he's, he's someone who works in film, he works in television, he works in the stage, he works in graphic novels, he's writing now, um, he's deeply influenced by music, and I, and I think to come here on this night for this lecture, uh, a lecture that is really, its hallmark has been celebrating intellectual achievement across all spheres of human accomplishment, in journalism, in science, in, in literature, um, to have somebody who in, in, in really important ways over the course of his history has worked across all of those fields it, it, it is a fitting kind of a continuation of the tradition that was established here by, by, by Jack Rudin and the Rudin family. So without further ado, it is my great pleasure to welcome to the microphone Vivek Tuari to speak about Brian F. Speed the fifth beetle. Okay, now you can fly. <laughs> Thank you so much. Fundamentally, almost no one coming from the Dominican Republic to the United States is coming because they have a skill that would benefit us and that would indicate their likely success in our society. Those are remarks made on the US Senate floor on May 22, 2006 from the Republican Senator from Alabama, Jeff Sessions. Now, even though I'm beginning with this quote, I want to assure you that I'm not about to deliver a political lecture tied to current events. And to be fair to the Senator who would, uh, in less than 10 years, become our US Attorney General, he certainly wasn't at the time, nor is he today, the only person by a long shot who has those opinions. Um, in fact, it's not just the people that don't want us here that fear that we may amount to nothing. Um, it is our very own parents. It's the immigrants themselves. Um, my parents were immigrants from the Republic of Guyana, and, uh, and I was born here in the United States, and my parents instilled in me ever since I was a little kid the absolute importance, the necessity uh, to amount to something when I grew up. They said that I needed to work harder, to study harder, and to generally just be better than my white friends if I was to take advantage of the opportunities that America could offer. And in my experience, that is a common message that immigrant parents uh, instill in their children. This sense of fear of amounting to nothing and the necessity uh, to, uh, to prove that wrong. Um, my parents loved America. They thought this was a great country and they really did believe that it was a land of incredible opportunity. However, they believed that for me, and they kept telling me this ever since I was a little kid, I would have slightly less opportunity and I would have to work harder for it. But that didn't mean that the opportunity wasn't there. They believed that America was a land of opportunity, but as, an, as a child of an immigrant, I had to work harder for it. Now, my family, uh, as I said, were uh, immigrated here from Guyana, South America, but originally the family is from India, so in some ways that you could say they, they were double immigrants. Um, and many uh, Indian families, uh, and certainly uh, Indian immigrants, 
uh, are known for pushing their kids. And they push their kids traditionally into fields um, like, uh, like um, medicine and engineering. We're expected to become doctors and engineers or study technology. And this is not because from time immemorial, brown people make better healers and builders. Um, the reason for this is that those uh, fields, the fields of medicine and engineering, are noble fields, they are secure fields, and they're lucrative fields. And as a dad myself these days, I understand why that's what you want for your children. Moreover, uh, the in Indian cultural heritage believes in repetitive cycles of, of birth, destruction, rebirth, an endless cycle of creation and destruction followed again by creation and destruction. And in this kind of worldview, there will always be a need for healing and building. Therefore, pursuing careers such as becoming a doctor or an engineer are, is a wonderful way to both serve your family and to add value to your country. That's the reason that Indian parents uh, want their children to become doctors and engineers. Now, for me, this was a little problematic. Uh, I was born not just in America, I'm not just an American, I was born here in this wicked little town that we call New York City. Um, I grew up surrounded by the arts, and my first love was music. I did not want to become a doctor or an engineer. I believed in the American dream, and my American dream was to write comic books and produce Broadway musicals and maybe take a punk rock album and put it on a Broadway stage. Now, you can imagine how, to my immigrant parents, that kind of dream was sheer insanity. Um, or being a little less melodramatic, in a best case scenario, that was seemingly impossible. I was dreaming the seemingly impossible. Now, while I was uh, defining my dreams and finding out that I was not interested in becoming a doctor or an engineer, I was still, um, holding on to the, the principles of the immigrant experience uh, the, or the perspective that I had as a child of immigrants. And I believe that there are four elements of that. The first is feeling like an outsider. You know, no matter uh, the fact that I was born here, I will always be a little bit of other. Um, there's a sense of being an outsider. There's the sense of needing to define your dreams earlier than some of your peers. There's the, set, the, that's the second thing. The third thing is the necessity to work harder um, to achieve those dreams. And the fourth thing is the necessity to prove yourself and to prove that you belong. Um, I believe that, that those are sort of the four key uh, principles of the, the immigrant experience, or in particular, because I'm speaking for myself, the experience of the children of immigrants, the descendants of immigrants. Now, the question for me then became, how do I find a mentor or some guidance in order to pursue my dreams of working in the arts and entertainment industries while still holding on to those principles? Um, there, were no, there was no one, in, no mentors available in my family uh, or in my community um, to help me along these lines. And uh, I found it in the most unlikeliest of places. I found it in a gay Jewish kid who died three years before I was born, who grew up in the United Kingdom as the descendant of immigrants from Russia and the Ukraine, which was then a part of the, the Russian Empire, uh, and, um, and who lived in the town of Liverpool. His name was Brian Samuel Epstein. And his story starts in Liverpool in 1961. And the beginning of his story really does sound like the beginning of some kind of truly tasteless joke. So this gay Jew walks into a bar. That's how Brian Epstein's story starts. And, and it probably felt like a truly tasteless joke to him as well. He was 27 years old. Uh, if you were gay in Liverpool, you were thrown in jail. If you were Jewish, you faced daily taunts of pervasive anti-Semitism. And the bar was a basement club where teenagers were gathered in drain pipe jeans and dirty leather jackets to see a rock band perform. And Brian Epstein didn't even like rock and roll music. He was a fan of jazz and classical. Nevertheless, what seems like the setup for a truly tasteless joke 
was actually the beginning of a revolution because that night Brian saw the Beatles and they were nothing special. <laughs> they spent most of their set goofing around with the audience. They were talking on stage, smoking on stage. They would occasionally turn and play with their backs to the crowd so that people couldn't even really see what they were doing. They, at this point in their career, had already exhausted whatever opportunities Liverpool had to offer a developing artist, small as they were. They had even gone over to Hamburg, uh, where they did a stint, and returned from Hamburg to Liverpool, having gotten kicked out of the country of Germany and having lost their then bass player, Stu Sutcliffe, who stayed behind for a girl. Uh, the Beatles had essentially already hit a ceiling, and it was a very low one. They were the biggest group of teenage losers that Brian Epstein had ever laid his eyes on. He was literally about to turn and walk out of the cavern when finally something magical happened. And of course it happened through music. The Beatles decided to show a little bit of professionalism and play some songs. And most importantly, they decided to play some of the songs that John and Paul had written themselves. And in the Beatles' music, Brian heard a great message of love. I know that sounds awfully cheesy, but that's what it was. He heard this great message of love and belonging. And he paid particular attention, not just to, the, to how amazing the band was, but the reaction that the audience was having to the band. And all of a sudden, this, this small room where he felt totally out of place, everybody sort of was moving as one and felt connected. And it was the first time in his adult life that this fish out of water felt like he belonged. He walked out of the Cavern Club that night with big dreams. He thought that the Beatles' message of love could be and should be heard all around the world if it was just packaged and presented in the right way. And he thought that he was just the guy to help them do that. He said, with my guidance, the Beatles are going to be bigger than Elvis. With my guidance, the Beatles are going to elevate pop music into an art form, whatever that means. People laughed at him. In the weeks that followed, people told him, those dreams are stupid. That second one about elevating pop music into an art form, that dream doesn't even make any sense. And moreover, people like you don't do things like that. And it was in those weeks that followed, Brian Epstein fully embraced his own immigrant experience, his own experience as the child of immigrants. He knew that he was an outsider, and he knew that wasn't going to change, one. Two, he defined his dreams very specifically. Three, he knew that he was going to have to work his tail off to achieve those dreams. And four, boy, did he have something to prove. This was 1961. Two years later, by 1963, Brian Epstein had turned the Beatles already into the biggest pop culture phenomenon the world had ever seen. And here we are still celebrating the Beatles more than half a century uh, from when they were first, when they first started making music. Sgt. Peppers is celebrating its 50th anniversary this year. I find that incredibly inspiring. I believe if there's one message to the Brian Epstein story, it's that no dream is too impossible and no person too unlikely to realize that dream. I will say that one more time. If you take one thing away from anything that I tell you tonight, let it be this that no dream is too impossible and no person too unlikely to realize that dream. And honestly, you know, forget about immigrants. That's a dream, that, that's a message that everyone, that all of humankind uh, can relate to and can benefit from. Um, now the question is how I came to that dream and that understanding. So for me, uh, the process of learning about Brian Epstein was to use a Beatles lyric, a, a long and winding road. <laughs> It started when I entered business school. I was at the Wharton School of Business in 1991. At this point, I had made it clear to my family that I was not going to become a doctor or an engineer. Um, so the next thing that was expected of me was that I would join my family business, which would sell, see me selling food products or financial securities, um, also things that, that I was not interested at all, in at all. Um, so like many uh, college students, I was very um, concerned and confused you know, I loved my parents very much, and I was concerned that 
um, I would follow my dreams and let them down. And uh, paradoxically, I was also concerned that I would not follow my dreams and I would sell my soul and I would not let my parents down. So how was I going to resolve this? Now, Wharton in 1991 just didn't have any resources for students who were interested in working in the arts and entertainment industries. You guys are so blessed that you are, are, work, are living at a time where academic institutions are, are teaching the arts in the way that they are now. I mean, in 1991, this was also prior to the internet boom, and so business students weren't even encouraged to go into new media, um, or even old media, uh, much less to go into the arts. I mean, Wharton at the time was all about finance and accounting and Wall Street and investment banking. So I really was a, a you know, black sheep at the school in, in those days dreaming about a career in the arts and entertainment industries. So my mother had always encouraged me throughout my entire life that if I wasn't uh, getting what I needed from my surroundings, that I had to go out and find it for myself. So I thought if I wasn't getting this from my classes, I needed to go out and do the research on my own. And my first dream was to uh, work as a music manager. I wanted to work in all the artistic disciplines, but I wanted to start with artist management. And so I thought, if I'm going to be an entertainment entrepreneur, and I'm going to start with artist management, I should study the lives of the great artist managers. I believe that the Beatles and their management team wrote and then rewrote the rules of the pop music business. So I naturally thought I should study the life of their manager, Brian Epstein. Um, so the first thing I did was I went to the Barnes & Nobles, the campus bookstore. And I was stunned to find that there were no books about Brian. I literally found a book about John Lennon's astrologist, and I couldn't find a book about the guy that discovered the band. It's crazy. Um, I mean, to this day, The Fifth Beatle is the only book in print about Brian, graphic novel or otherwise. As a quick aside, if you're interested in the topic, there is a wonderful book called The Man Who Made the Beatles by Ray Coleman that's been out of print for a number of decades. Uh, and in 1991, I think it was impossible to find. These days, you can find it quite easily on Amazon Marketplace or Abe Books or any number of these used book websites. But none of those existed when, uh, when I was beginning this research. And quite frankly, uh, the man who made the Beatles, Ray Coleman, was a friend of Brian. And he readily admits in his introduction that, um, that it's a biased take and there's a number of things that he doesn't really get into uh, because of Brian's personal life. Uh, but it's still a wonderful read. So, but for me, I had no choice but to do interviews. So I basically got my hand on every respected Beatles book I could find, and I would read these 300, 400 page books about the Beatles, and I might get 10 or 15 decent pages about Brian Epstein. But what I did get out of that was a portrait in my head of the people who knew him best. His friends, his enemies, his colleagues, his clients, his family members, uh, etc. And then what I did was, uh, I joke around that I, I turned to the most sophisticated piece of technology I could find in those days, a device about this big, it was a, a telephone book. Um, the older folks in the audience will remember phone books. Um, you have to remember in 1991, we had no Wikipedia, we had no YouTube, we had no Google. You know, we had none of these online resources you so take for granted these days. I had to turn to a physical phone book uh, and I focused on folks who were within driving distance of New York City, which I called home, and Philadelphia, where I was at school, where, where UPenn and uh, Wharton was based. And I literally just cold called them. People like Nat Weiss, who was the Beatles' US attorney and was, um, became Brian Epstein's best friend and closest confidant. Uh, people like Sid Bernstein, uh, who was the legendary concert promoter that first brought the Beatles over to the United States the first time. Um, Nat was also gay and was able to illuminate a lot of the struggles that Brian faced as a gay man, and Sid was Jewish and was able to illuminate a lot of the struggles that the two of them faced as young Jewish hustlers trying to make it in the music industry in the, in the 1960s. And I literally just cold called these folks, and I said, I am a student uh, looking for more information about Brian Epstein, I'm not writing a, a screenplay or a, or a journalistic article, you know, I'm not even writing a term paper. I'm, I'm just a kid who's looking for more knowledge and more inspiration. The little bit that I know is inspiring to me, and would you please sit down with me and, and then tell me more about Brian. And I will tell you, not one of them turned me down. I was so excited to reach out to these folks that I forgot to be intimidated. And they were lovely to me. And by focusing on people that I could actually sit down with, I had the opportunity to get to know them um, over a number of years. You know, the first meeting 
uh, they got to see that I was genuine and I was passionate and that, that uh, you know, I didn't have any ulterior motives and that allowed me to have a follow-up meeting and follow-up meetings after that and eventually these folks became friends. Uh, and the stories that they told me were outstanding. And I'm gonna share one of them with you tonight, one Beatles story with you tonight. And there are many more uh, in my book, which I hope you will pick up uh, afterwards. I'd be happy to sign it for you. If I learn anything else from Brian Epstein, it's also you have to promote your stuff wherever you can. So please buy my book. Um, but, uh, but I'm going to share one of these stories with you tonight. Um, so this story starts off in uh, America on Christmas Day in 1963. So Christmas Day, 1963, United States. Virtually no one has heard of the Beatles. Less than two months later, beginning of February 1964, 63 million Americans tune into the Ed Sullivan Show to see the Beatles play live. Now, how did that happen? Well, it happened because Brian Epstein realized that the hot Christmas present that year in 1963 was a small device not much bigger than one of today's modern cell phones. It was a transistor radio. Now, 1963 wasn't the year that the transistor radio was invented but it was the year that it was cheap enough to manufacture that, uh, that it was being sold at affordable prices. And every kid in America wanted one, and virtually every parent in America could afford to get one for their, for their kids. So it was the hot stocking stuff for that year. Now the transistor radio marked a true sea change in the consumption of popular music, especially amongst the youth. It's really impossible for, for folks like myself uh, who weren't there to, to really appreciate what this meant. You know, uh, you can try to compare it to the first Walkman or the first Discman or the first iPod, but it really is much more significant than that because this was the first time that young people didn't have to listen to their music at home in front of a big piece of furniture with their parents and their kid brothers. They could take their music with them, and the listening of music became the listening of recorded music became a social experience. They could, they could listen with their friends in the locker room or, or outside after school at a picnic table. Or they could put a little earbud in and, and make music, the listening of music a solitary personal experience. And this was a radical shift in how recorded music was consumed amongst the youth. And Brian saw that this sea change was coming. Perhaps equally importantly, he recognized this, the, the increasing importance that the renegade DJs were going to have, the DJs who were talking to the youth on those radio stations through those transistor radios. People like New York City's Murray the K. And what Brian did was he particularly endeared himself and the Beatles to these renegade DJs. To the extent that when the band was coming over, he leaked their flight information. He told those DJs, this is when the band is coming in. I want you to tell your listeners to come out to the airport to see them when they arrive. And tell everyone to pass it on. Tell them to bring a friend and tell their friend to bring a friend. It was the 1964 equivalent of tweeting it. <laughs> it happened right out in public and it went right over the heads of all the parents and all the mainstream media. And then Brian did a really disruptive thing. He decided to throw the press conference for the band at the airport. Who throws press conferences at airports? Press conferences are held in rooms like this, or at convention centers, or at hotels. What the band should have done is they had been flying across the ocean uh, on an overnight flight. They were exhausted. They should have gone back to their hotel, washed up, and then the next afternoon or the next morning, gone to their publicist's office and held the press conference there. But no, Brian wanted to have the press conference at the airport. Now, the airport was the newly christened JFK Airport. Uh, John F. Kennedy had been uh, assassinated just a handful of months before, and the airport had renamed itself from Idlewild to JFK. So a lot of the mainstream reporters who were covering this had never been out to see the new JFK. So they thought, this is kind of silly that there's this, this random band coming over from the UK who apparently are a big deal over there. Uh, but you know, it's a day out of the office. I'll, uh, I'll be able to take the entire day off because I have to go all the way out to the airport and it'll be a chance to, uh, to see JFK, to see the newly rechristened uh, John F. Kennedy Airport. So all the traditional media who really didn't know much about the Beatles and could care less about them decided to come out to the airport. And when they got out to the airport, they saw thousands of kids 
descending on the airport to see these guys when they arrived. And then the Beatles did what Brian knew they would do, which is charm the press. If you've seen any of those old, old Beatles conferences, press conferences, you can actually see the one where they arrived. It's at the, at, uh, at the, they did the uh, conference at the Pan Am building, and you could just Google it and see it now. It's easy to see now. Um, and, uh, and you'll see that they're very witty and very funny, and you know, the press asks them difficult or, or you know, sort of slightly snarky questions, and they turn everything into a, a funny joke, and it's lovely and wonderful, and they charm the press. And then all of a sudden, the Beatles were America's sweethearts. And not just to the kids, but to the older folks in the mainstream media. Zero to 63 million in less than two months. Incredibly inspiring stuff. Ironically, however, for me, the most inspiring stuff that I uh, gleaned from the Brian Epstein story came not through the Beatles at all. And I will be the first to admit that when I began my studies of Brian Epstein, I was a business student. I wanted to know the business stories. I wanted to know, how did he get them a record deal when no one wanted to sign them? How did he convince Ed Sullivan to book the band when a British band had never made an impact in the United States? How did he convince the record labels to allow them to experiment with sitars and tablas when they were essentially, prior to those records, just a boy band? Um, these were the stories that I was chasing. And I got them, and they were inspiring. Um, however, what I wasn't looking for that the folks who I started interviewing slowly began to reveal to me as we became friends was elements of his personal life. And he was gay at a time where it was literally against the law, as I mentioned earlier. The situation was so bad in the United Kingdom that two men holding hands walking down the street in Liverpool would have been thrown in jail. Two women maybe as well. It's a little easier on women, but not much. Um, Brian Epstein spent his entire adult life helping a band spread a great message of love around the world, and yet he died at the young age of 32 from an accidental overdose of prescription pills, a number of which were prescribed to help cure him of his homosexuality. He died constantly having to hide his own love away, to use a cheesy Beatles line, um, and, uh, and he never had a proper boyfriend. Brian Epstein was also Jewish at a time of pervasive anti-Semitism and, interestingly enough, at a time where Jews did not work extensively in the music industry. For those of you who follow the music industry, that might be a little bit hard to believe um, because these days there are a number of very powerful Jewish figures in the music industry, but that was the case in the 1960s, especially in the United Kingdom, where the music industry was run by folks like Sir Joseph Lockwood, you know, older white Christian knights of the British Empire. It wasn't when, you know, the companies were HMV, Her Majesty's Voice, you know, uh, His Majesty's Voice, excuse me, still Boys Club. Um, and, you know, it wasn't run by young people with last names like Epstein. Times certainly have changed, but that was the situation back then. Uh, Anti Semitism was also so prevalent uh, in the United Kingdom that it was like a way of life. You know, I mentioned those Beatles conferences where the band is witty and they turn everything around, they never answer a question straight, everything gets turned into a joke. Um, if you spent any time in the north of England, you know that this is a, a, a characteristic of folks from the north. Uh, it's, very, it's a very Scouse thing, it's a very Liverpool-like thing to have this kind of wit. It's very funny and charming. Not so funny or charming if you were Jewish, because every day you face anti-Semitic jokes wrapped up in that same kind of fancy wit. And people didn't even realize they were being rude. And finally, Brian was from Liverpool. And Liverpool, prior to the Beatles, is a port town in the north that had, and still has, two very important football teams, Liverpool and Everton, um, but has no cultural influence whatsoever. People were not looking to Liverpool for the next big artistic thing. So in Brian Epstein, you have a gay Jewish 27-year-old kid running around a dirty port town in the north of England saying, I have found a local rock and roll band who are going to be bigger than Elvis and who are going to elevate pop music into an art form. And I'm not going to join my Jewish family's well-respected furniture store, which is what is expected of me as the eldest son in a Jewish family, and instead I'm going to manage this band. 
I, I hope at this point in my presentation you could see how that was incredibly inspiring to the weirdo Indian kid that I was in my 20s running around New York's Lower East Side saying I was going to write comic books and put a punk rock album on a Broadway stage. The Brian Epstein story filled me with hope and possibility in much the same way I suspect the Beatles did for him on that night in 1961. It is why for me, Brian Epstein deserves the title, The Fifth Beatle. It is also why, for me, I personally call Brian my historical <coughs> mentor. And I want to talk for a minute about this concept of the historical mentor. Um, so I believe a historical mentor is someone who you haven't had a chance to meet. You know, they died before you had a chance to meet them. Brian died in 1967, and I was born in 1973. But it, it's someone Who's, he's someone whose life I have studied meticulously in every way I could, from reading books to doing interviews, to get a model of what to do and what not to do. Um, I believe that all mentors are human beings and they're inherently flawed. And you learn from your mentors, both from their successes and their failures, both from the things that they do well and the things that they do poorly. That's what I think a good mentor is. So a historical mentor is somebody whose life you, you dive into deep studies um, to, to get this kind of, of guide and role model for inspiration from history. Um, and I, you know, I do talks um, like this and, and to young people, to colleges and high schools quite often. And I, I will often meet young people who say things like, well, I have this, these certain dreams, but there's no one in my family or in my community that can help me with this kind of stuff. They don't have that course at my college. And I just, you know, there's no way that I can pursue this dream. And I always tell them that's nonsense. You know, and if that's how you feel, you're just being lazy. Because the history of humankind is full of inspiration. And especially today, when you do have Wikipedia and YouTube and Google, and to use that phrase, the information superhighway, you have that information far more available than I did in 1991. You have no excuse not to go to history and find yourself a historical mentor. I believe that everyone should have a historical mentor, not just the, the students and the, the, the college kids. You guys should definitely have one, but everyone else should as well. The best thing about a historical mentor is that they're dead. <laughs> they can't say no. They can't not take your call. They can't uh, tell you they're too busy. They can't tell you there's no more spaces in my class. The, their information, their inspiration is there for the taking. Of course, I'm being a little flippant. You know, the other difficult thing about a historical mentor is that they're dead. And you have to put in the work. You know, as I said, part of my parents' example as immigrants was not just define your dreams and pursue it, but that you have to work harder than everybody else. So if you have to have a historical mentor because you can't find a living, breathing one, yeah, you might have to work five times harder to get the inspiration from that historical mentor, but it's there. And, and this is a good moment for me to also point out that like reading a Wikipedia article and looking at a couple of YouTube videos is not doing research into a historical mentor. That's the place to start. But if you want to have a historical mentor, you have to dig deep. You have to dig deeper than just reading a couple of books. You have to pretend that you're the guy or gal who's going to write that book and do the research that that author might have had to do. Do your interviews. Go to places that they lived. Soak up the experiences that they had. That's how you find in, uh, uh, inspiration from a historical mentor. Now, I can't tell you who that may be for you. Um, if you are a young person who is interested in politics and you want to pursue a form of politics or an area of politics that your ethnicity doesn't typically pursue or, and you have no contacts in that world, maybe you should study the life of Abraham Lincoln who ran for public office, I believe, three times and lost and was told that he would never become president, that his ideas were too radical and he should just give it up. As a person of color, I'm really glad he didn't. I'm really glad that he pursued those dreams with passion and persistence. If you are a young woman who is interested in pursuing a type of sports in which women don't traditionally participate and there aren't enough uh, opportunities for sports clubs for women for that particular sport. Maybe you should meticulously study the life of Amelia Earhart, who was told literally and figuratively that women couldn't soar. And she proved them all wrong. But whoever it is for you, I can't encourage you more to find yourself a historical mentor. 
Now, what have I done with, uh, with the inspiration that I got from my historical mentor? Well, I'll give you um, a relatively brief overview on how well, on my career path, and I'm happy during the questions and answers, I'll try to leave a lot of time for questions. I'm happy to dig deeper into any of the areas that I've worked in uh, during that, uh, that portion of the evening. But let me tell you what I did. So I got my start working in the music industry. My first, jobs, uh, my first job was, was as an intern for a local Philadelphia music production and publishing company called Integrated Entertainment. Uh, I went to a lecture at school uh, that was poorly attended because no one cared about the arts and working in the music industry. And the gentleman who ran that company was giving the talk. And at the end of the talk, he asked, if, does anyone have any questions? And I raised my hand, I had a question. He answered my question and he said, does anyone else have any questions? Raise my hand, I have another question. Does anyone else have any questions? I had a third question. And then eventually it was like a dialogue between me and this guy. And so I walked up to him at the end of the lecture and I said, if you ever need anyone to work for you, you know, I'm your man. And he said, you know, I might. He gave me his card. He said, give me a call and come down to my office next week. And I remember walking down to his office the next week feeling like a total schmuck. I was a second year Wharton student and I hadn't, didn't even have a resume. I, you know, had any jobs that I have were working for my family or babysitting or dog walking, you know, and most of my peers were like polishing their resumes to send them off to investment banks and Wall Street gigs. Uh, and to this day, I honestly cannot remember what I told him <laughs> in that first meeting, but I guess whatever I said impressed him enough that he gave me a job as his assistant, basically, you know, running the office, which meant sending faxes, and you know, we had fax machines then, um, organizing the CD closet, we had CDs back then, um, and answering phones. That, those are my responsibilities. And I was over the moon that I was in. And, oh, and I wasn't getting paid anything. Um, but I was so excited, I did, I'd gotten in. And I remember calling my mom that night and I was so thrilled that I had this job. And she was like, that's nice. She was like, is it, is it gonna affect your studies? You know, and I said, it's not gonna affect my studies. And I understood, I was like, and I'm gonna show her how this is gonna lead to great things. And while I was, you know, as I said, my responsibilities were just, were just these menial office tasks, but they were working with local bands. And as I, they were downtown, and as I went back uptown to West Philadelphia at the end of the day, I would look around and I, would, I kept thinking like, what could I do on the campus to help these bands? I lived across the street from the campus radio station, so I thought, oh, well, maybe I could bring in some of these local bands to get some airplay on the campus radio station. Um, I lived next to a bunch of fraternity houses that I knew through parties that were often band parties. So I was like, one of these bands kind of is jammy and might be, uh, might be good for some of these frat parties. Maybe I could try to get them some gigs. I was writing record reviews for 34th Street, which was the entertainment supplement for the Daily Pennsylvania, the school newspaper. So I thought I could talk to the music editor about writing some album reviews, not just for the big bands that were coming out at the time, but for some of these small local bands. Now, at the time, I was just making this stuff up, just sort of walking around and thinking about what, what I could do. I would later learn that these were sort of the textbook elements of music marketing, retail marketing, radio promotion, uh, press and publicity, et cetera. But I was just sort of making this stuff up. And so I went to my, my boss and I said, I would like to do this. I'm not asking you to pay me. It's not gonna take away any time from just managing the office. I just want the opportunity to do it. Will you provide me the resources, like you know, the contact information for the guy who books the bands, some extra CDs to give the radio stations, et cetera. And obviously he was incredibly excited for me to do those, to do those things for him, especially if I didn't have to, it wasn't gonna cost him anything. It was, it was a, a no-brainer. So I did it and it, went, it was incredibly successful. Those bands did really well on the UPenn campus and the bands were very happy. And that boss, uh, as I was going home for a summer, uh, referred, helped to get me a summer job working for a small record label called Seed Records that was a division of Atlantic Records. And uh, similarly, my responsibilities there were I was the assistant to the head of the label and I was responsible for answering his phones and making sure his schedule was, was uh, adhered to and you know, there was nothing glamorous. Uh, but while I was there, I said, you should start a college marketing arm. You know, Seeds, if you have in, in indie rock bands that would, would do well at college campuses, you should be specifically marketing these bands to college campuses. And I had read an article in Rolling Stone about this, uh, this position called the College Marketing Rep, which were college students that represented the great major labels and helped to market their bands around campus. And I thought, God, that is the coolest job ever. 
and I got to know the reps in Philly, and unfortunately there were no open positions, so I couldn't apply for that, but I was like, when I got to CDOT, I could start that program. So I suggested that I do that, and again, I said, I'm not looking for, uh, for it to be paid, I'm not looking for, I'm not gonna take care of the office, I just want the resources to be able to do, to do this. And having been referred by my previous boss, who said Vivek's really a go-getter, he will do what he says he's gonna do, they allowed me to do that. And because Seed was also affiliated with Atlantic, in order to get anything done, in order to get any budget passed, because it wasn't gonna cost much, but it was gonna cost something, I had to meet with a lot of Atlantic top brass, including the then head of Atlantic Records, a, a, ver a very famous music industry executive named Danny Goldberg. And so I had to convince all these folks to let me do this, and I did. And I started that program, and it went really, really well. And then when I got back to campus, all of a sudden I learned that a Sony college rep position had opened up. And so I applied for that position, and I remembered sitting down with, uh, with the head of the department, and uh, I said it in, in a more graceful way than I'm saying it now, but I was like, I, I don't really have any experience being a college rep, but I did start a program. You know, I, I, I've done your job, <laughs> you know, like, I ran the program for this tiny company. And, and sure enough, he was incredibly impressed, and he gave me that job, and finally I had uh, what I thought was a dream job, and it, it was a really wonderful job. And uh, after I graduated, uh, I moved back to New York, where, which I called home. Um, as a quick aside, my, my intention was really to move back, uh, to move, excuse me, to the United Kingdom and work in the UK music industry because I, I tend to be a bit of an Anglophile. A lot of my favorite bands have come out of the UK. Um, but my father had passed away when I was at school and I was an only child and my mother was grieving and I thought I should go home and be with my mom. And I'm lucky that, you know, home is New York City and I could still pursue my dreams of the arts and entertainment industries in New York City and, uh, and be with my mother. Uh, it, it turned out that that was one of the best things I ever did because uh, my mother also ended up passing away about a little over a year from that moment um, from the cancer and totally unexpected. And I remember when I moved back home, a lot of my colleagues, you know, fellow Wharton uh, graduates who went on to high paying jobs and had modest but, but their own apartments uh, in New York City. And they're like, gosh, you're home living with your mom. Like, is that awful? It's like, no, it's, you know, it's, it's actually kind of nice. And, you know, a year later, I lost her forever, and I was so grateful that I had that year, that I was able to spend that time with her. It's one of those moments that you know, sometimes the universe gives you what you need. And the reason I'm, I, I'm telling that quick aside is that um, I also believe that you need to constantly evaluate and reevaluate your priorities. You know, my dream was to pursue a career in the arts and entertainment industries, but I didn't want to take that so far that I was going to sacrifice being there for my mother, um, who I loved, and that I would you know, do the wrong thing for my family that I had to take priority, and looking back on it, I'm so glad that it did. And sometimes you have to make those difficult decisions and just find a way to make it work. And I, I guarantee you, if your heart's in the right place, you will find a way to make it work. But that's what I did. So I moved back home, and I started working for Mercury Records. I was there for about uh, two and a half years. Uh, Mercury was a division of Polygram, and uh, Polygram, in, at the end of 1998, was purchased by the Seagram's Corporation, who owned Universal. Um, so they were going to merge Polygram and Universal. Uh, budgets were frozen, everyone was miserable, um, people were worried that they were going to shut down the labels, and everybody, all my colleagues, uh, my coworkers, were looking for jobs. And I had always dreamed about starting my own company. I should have I sort of I mentioned my parents earlier, my, my grandparents, who were the ones that immigrated from, from, uh, from India to Guyana. Uh, my grandfather was a huge influence on my life. Uh, he always told me the, there, there are two important principles in this world. You have to work for yourself and you have to do, to do what you love. I suspect when he said work for yourself, he meant work for the family business. Um, but but, but I, I hope that you know, wherever he is, he's looking down and seeing that I took his words to heart. Uh, but you know, So I, I love the arts and that was what I pursued. But I, the end goal was always to work for myself. And I thought at that moment, rather than look for another job, I had also already started to manage a band on the side, a friend's band from high school. Uh, I thought, this is the moment. Let me jump in and start my own company. Uh, you know, I have a decent reputation. I have a relatively good uh, Rolodex of contacts. We also used Rolodexes back then. <laughs> um, and so let me, let me just dive in and start my company. So I did. I left Mercury and I started my own company. And I grew up wanting to work in all the artistic disciplines, not just music, even though my background was working in music at the time. Um, so I immediately put word out to my network that I wanted to get involved in other, uh, in other media. And because I was based in New York, 
uh, I thought that I should start with Broadway. I suspect if I was living in Los Angeles, I would have started with film. Uh, my thinking was also, which, which looking back on it isn't really perfect thinking, but it did kind of work for me. I thought, let me start with Broadway and, and master Broadway, and then I'll expand to film and television. Um, you know, Broadway, uh, the budgets are smaller than, than major films. You know, the, the most expensive Broadway show to date, not counting Spider-Man, uh, was Shrek, which I believe, is, I didn't work on Shrek, so my numbers might be a little off, but somewhere around 18.5 million. So 18, 19 million dollars for a Broadway show is a tremendous amount of money. For a feature film, not, not a small independent, for a, for a feature film, that, that's a, a tremendously small number. Um, Broadway also has the opportunity to, um, or theater, I should say, has the opportunity to develop a little slower. You can open a show out of town, you can try it out, you can workshop it. Broadway can be very brutal in terms of once you get to Broadway, a show can open and close very quickly, but you can spend some time sort of developing a show in a, in a way that you really can't with film. You know, once you, you get a distributor for your film and your film opens in, in, um, in theaters and cinemas, uh, you know, if it doesn't have a good opening weekend or doesn't have a good first couple of weeks, the theater's gonna kick you out so they can bring something else in. It's just the way that it works. Whereas with theater, if the theater kicks you out, you can still open it somewhere else and, and you can still tour it and you can still find other, other lives for it. Again, this logic wasn't perfect. You know, film, you can also put it out on DVD or now streaming or get a cable deal. So it's not great logic. But that was my logic, and, and, it, and, it, and to be honest, it did work for me. And that's what I set out to do. I'm based in New York, work on Broadway first, I'll, I'll make my way over to, to film and television once I've mastered the, the Broadway budgets and the Broadway timeframes. And the players are kind of similar. It's the same agents and actors and development process, hiring writers, getting source material, raising the money. The processes are, are similar. They're not exactly the same, but they're similar. So, I managed to uh, join a project to open a Broadway Hall of Fame that ended up not happening, but through that project I met some of the lead producers of the producers of Mel Brooks Musical, and they invited me to join them on that project. And I did raise a little bit of money for, for the show, so I did earn my place at the table, uh, but really I will be the first to admit I kept my mouth shut, and I kept my eyes and ears open, and I asked those producers whether they would let me attend meetings and be on conference calls that I probably shouldn't have been allowed to be on, and I promised to be quiet, and I learned how to produce. And those of you who follow Broadway will know that the show wound up being tremendously successful, um, so it was a great show to learn from. And then uh, some of those producers went on to produce Hairspray, and so they offered uh, me a small position on that show, which I also took, and it was a similar situation where I raised some money, but then mostly used it as an opportunity to learn. And that show ended up being tremendously <laughs> successful. And in entertainment, when you sort of have two successful shows on your, on your <coughs> resume, so to speak, uh, even if you didn't have much to do with them, um, you know, it, it puts you in a good position to keep working in that field. And so all of a sudden, I was kind of off to the races in theater. And, uh, and then I decided to take a sort of leading producer role, a, a role where I was involved, was involved in all the major decisions and was really charting the progress of the show um, to produce A Raisin in the Sun. And this was not the recent version with Denzel Washington, but the version uh, a few seasons before that where we cast Sean Combs, or P. Diddy, uh, as he's more, more commonly known as the male lead in the show. And at the time, I remembered everyone telling me, my colleagues, uh, my producing mentors, those folks who, who had taught me how to produce, they all said the same thing. They said, you're crazy, don't do this show. African Americans don't come to Broadway, kids don't come to Broadway, Sean Combs can't act, he won't be a draw, you're gonna lose your shirt. And I thought, that's nonsense. You know, if African Americans and kids aren't coming to Broadway, it's because there's nothing on Broadway they wanna see. And if there is anything on Broadway they want to see, they probably don't know it's there because they don't care what Bren Brantley has to say in the New York Times theater reviews, you know? So if you reach out to them on the radio stations that they're listening to, or you pass out flyers at the clubs they're hanging out at, uh, and show them that there's something happening that they're going to want to see, of course they're gonna come. And, uh, and so I pursued that project, and I remember doing things like hiring street teams. I used my music mar marketing background. And these days, everybody does that. But back then, when like, you know, my theater producing colleagues were like, you're having kids pass out flyers at clubs? Like, that's so weird. Um, but it worked. Uh, the show broke even in, I think it was six weeks, which may still be a record on Broadway. Uh, we had a tremendous run. 
we were nominated for a bunch of Tonys. Uh, Felicia Rashad won Best Actress. It was the first time an African American had won Best Actress. I'm incredibly proud of that show. And I attended the Tonys uh, that year. One of the awards that we were nominated for was Best Revival, which is a producer award. Um, we lost to Shakespeare, so I don't feel so bad. Um, <laughs> but it was a real thrill to, to attend. And, uh, and the reason I mention that is because um, I like to think that I'm still pretty young, but I really was a, was a kid back then. And at the time, I was the only producer of color on Broadway. Many people uh, of color working on Broadway, directing, acting, light designing, all the other uh, roles. But for whatever reason, there were no other producers of color on Broadway. Uh, at the time, Broadway was very much uh, um, older white guys. Uh, and, and just being very honest, and, and uh, a lot of wealthy, bored wives. It's, that's, that's what the producer makeup, uh, you know, uh, wives of, me of bankers who had money to invest and were bored. Um, they were not terribly active, they were the financiers, and the other folks, the old boys club, were the people who were terribly active. I'm not trying to pass judgment, I'm just saying what was a fact. And as a result, when I, when I sort of entered that world, people were looking at me like, who is this brown kid? And how did he crash our party? <laughs> and I want to be very clear, I have never uh, experienced or witnessed any racism on Broadway. Um, when people were looking at me like that, it was with, with intrigue and fascination as opposed to, to any sort of disgust or, or, what, or, or he shouldn't be here. Um, Broadway I found to be a remarkably open and welcoming place. In fact, I think they were sort of happy to see some fresh blood I think that's, that's probably why those producers, of the producers took me under their wing in the first place. Um, and in the wake of A Raisin in the Sun, I had to pick my projects very carefully because I felt all eyes were sort of on me. And I always pick my projects carefully, but I think at that specific moment in my career, people were really curious to see what I was gonna do next. And as proud as I was of Raisin, it is a revival of a classic piece of African American literature. Um, those of you who grew up in the States will know that you probably studied it in fifth grade or sixth grade. Um, and I wanted to tell a new story. And I realized that the new story that I wanted to tell was the Brian Epstein story. It was this, this story that I had been researching ever since I was a student in college. Uh, at the time, this was probably 10 years ago, so I had been studying it for you know, 10, 12 years already at the time. And nobody had told it yet. So I decided to set about doing that. And for reasons that, that I won't get into in this presentation, we can talk about it later, I, I believe that that made sense to do at, um, as a graphic novel or as television or film. So I set about to do it in those two media. Um, I didn't leave theater behind. Uh, I'm very passionate about theater. And I believe that you, know, you, you should focus on the story first and then figure out what medium is right for that story. So it's not as though I said, I'm just gonna do comics and film now and I'm gonna leave theater behind, I'm just gonna keep pursuing stories. So um, while I was developing The Fifth Beatle as a graphic novel, I was also pursuing theater dreams, and I produced Green Days America. My last two shows were Green Days American Idiots, um, which for me was a real dream come true. I'm proud of all the things that I've done, but that one, as I said, I, when I was a kid, I used to dream about bringing a punk rock album onto a Broadway stage. And you might argue, you know, those real music nerds in the audience might argue whether Green Day is a real punk rock band. And, I, and I, wouldn't, I wouldn't deny those arguments. I'm a Sex Pistols fan myself. I think Green Day is more power pop than punk. But nevertheless, <laughs> it felt like the dream come true. Um, so I'm very proud of that project. Uh, and similarly, I, I grew up as a huge fan of the Addams Family, even a fan of the old Charles Addams cartoons. So that one was a real, uh, a real fun project for me to work on as well. And, um, and I'm currently working with Alanis Morissette uh, to adapt her album, Jagged Little Pill, for the stage. And uh, we, we are, it's not 100% set in stone yet, but I, it looks like we're gonna be opening that show sometime in 2018 in Cambridge, Massachusetts at the American Repertory Theater uh, in advance of a Broadway run. Probably, I'm gonna guess Broadway will be early 2019. So please keep your, your eyes out for that. Um, and to bring you up to date with The Fifth Beatle, very exciting times for us with Fifth Beatle. The book came out in 2013 and did incredibly well. Uh, it was, it uh, became a number one New York Times bestseller. It's been adapted into 20 plus languages. 
It won every major literary award for which it was eligible, including the Eisner Award, which is the comic industry's version of the Oscar. It was um, named a best LGBT, uh, uh, I was a Lambda Literary finalist for best LGBTQ graphic novel. Um, and it's been added to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. It's been very gratifying. And we are current, currently adapting it into a television miniseries. It's going to be six one hour episodes. Uh, we've done a deal with a company called Sonar Entertainment that are television producers and financiers. So it's really moving very full steam ahead. We secured access to Beatles music, which was totally unprecedented. It took me three years, um, but I got Paul McCartney, Ringo Starr, Yoko Ono, and Olivia Harrison to all sign off on the project to allow me to do a deal with Sony ATV who control the Beatles music publishing. You may have heard that they don't own their own publishing. So I had to get both the sign off from the band and do a deal with Sony ATV. As I said, it took me three years, you know, and, and everybody told me it's never gonna happen, they're never gonna, gonna give it to you. And, and literally it was that same like, people like you can't do things like that because you know, Scorsese had tried to get it for something and he couldn't, and they're like, why are they gonna give it to you? Um, and I think they gave it to me because I was persistent and because I was passionate. And uh, I don't know this for a fact, but I get the impression that they get one or the other. You know, they get like a young person who's very passionate about something but doesn't show, have any track record to suggest that they're gonna be able to pull something off, or they get a Scorsese or someone, I don't know, Scorsese per se, but somebody of that caliber who clearly could do whatever they want, but it's not a passion project for them. It's just one of 10 things that they're working on. And I think I was an unusual combination of both. Even though I hadn't done a film or a television show before, I had this history of pulling off very unusual projects like American Idiot. So they gave me those music rights. Um, I should also say that, uh, and I'm really proud of this, that, that I literally have in my, in my files, in my memory folders, um, three rejection letters from the Beatles company. You know, a low level guy said, thank you for your request, but it's been denied. So I thought, I got to get to the mid-level gal. And the mid-level gal said, thank you for your request, but, but no. And I was like, I guess I have to get to the head, the CEO. And the then CEO at the time said, no, you know, uh, his name was, for th those of you who are Beatles fans, uh, it was Neil Aspinall, um, who ran the Beatles company for many years. He was uh, childhood friends with, with the four guys in the band, fiercely protective of their legacy, and um, he had a reputation in the business, who they called him Dr. No, N-O, because he said no to everything. Um, and he, he was, let me say that he was very good to me in other ways. He, he was very happy to talk to me about Brian, so he was a, he was a good guy. But I, but I genuinely believe Neil had to die before I was gonna get these rights, and, and he passed away, and, and his successor was, was more open to it than I was, than he was. Um, but, but you know, when Neil said no, I was like, okay, so the CEO of the Beatles company said no, I guess I have to get to Paul, Ringo, Yoko, and Olivia. You know, I just wouldn't stop, <laughs> you know? It was a labor of love for me, and, and, uh, and I found a way to make it happen. Um, so we have access to Beatles music, and we are currently casting we just started our casting efforts last week. Uh, I think within the next month or so, we're gonna be able to announce cast and network. Um, we already have some very preliminary interest from Netflix, which would be great. It was just a first meeting, so we'll see what happens, but we're targeting high-end streaming like Netflix, Amazon, and Hulu, and high-end cable like HBO, Showtime, and FX. Those are sort of the folks who've expressed some early interest, so it's a very, very exciting time for us. And um, I hope that you'll stay in touch with me and, and learn more about when that's coming out. We are um, on Facebook at The Fifth Beetle, and we're on Twitter at, at Fifth Beetle. And I'm also on Facebook uh, at Vivek J. Tawari, and I'm on Twitter at, at Vivek J. Tawari. Um, now, in summary, I started this conversation by saying that I wasn't gonna deliver a political speech tied to, to current events, and, and I really have tried not to do that, I really don't want to do that. Um, however, uh, in conclusion, I, I really do hope that you can benefit from my story, and in particular, from what I believe is a direct result of my experiences as the son of immigrants. Um, I will dare to say, I believe that the immigrant experience can and should inspire us all. And I will repeat what I think are the four things you can learn from what I believe are, are inherent to the immigrant experience. One, whenever you feel like an outsider, find a way to profit from it. And that's not an immigrant thing, that's a human thing. Every human being has had some moment where you feel like you didn't belong, or the, they just don't, my parents just don't understand me, or my college doesn't understand me, my friends don't get it, right? 
Every human being has had one of those moments. So take those outside moment, outsider moments and find a way to turn that into an asset, into a driving force. Two, define your dreams early. It's fun to dream. Dreams are awesome. You will enjoy defining your dreams. Doesn't mean you can't change them later in life, but define them early. The third thing, work hard to pursue those dreams. Get help to pursue those dreams. And if you can't find help around you, get yourself a historical mentor. And the fourth thing, go on and have that massive chip on your shoulder. Have something to prove. Forget about the United States. Show the entire world that your skills are valuable in it. And in closing, I just want to thank my parents. Their drive and their example are really what has made me the person that I am today. And I'm very proud of who I am today, even though I didn't become a doctor or an engineer. And I hope that wherever they are, they're somewhere looking down on me, and they might see that I have, in fact, benefited from their experience as immigrants. And with a little help from my historical mentor, I ended up achieving the seemingly impossible. Thank you. about Brian Epstein, but it does involve the Beatles. Will there be music in it? And are you going to get 
singers from outside to do the like the yeah. soundtrack or yeah, it's a good question. Or so, like so um, as I mentioned earlier, we, we did get this unprecedented access to Beatles music. So as a result of that, there's going to be a lot of music in it. We're lucky to have gotten that access, so we're going to use it. Um, in terms of how we're actually going to treat music in the series, I don't know yet uh, because we, um, to, to be very, to answer your question very specifically, the deal that we have, um, we have un we have unrestricted access to the publishing. So any song we want to use, there's a formula as to how much we have to pay for it, depending on how many seconds of the song we're using, whether it's for the end credits, or in a trailer, or in background, or in a lip-syncing moment. Depending on how we're using it, there's a predetermined dollar, uh, dollar sign attached to that. right? Um, if we want to then to also, in addition to that, also use a Beatles master recording, we want to use the actual Beatles track, there's no dollar sign attached to that yet. We have to go to, to Apple Corps and say, okay, so how much for yesterday? Which could be a different price from A Day in the Life, which could be a different price from Strawberry Fields. Um, my experience suggests that that will not be a cost-effective way to do it. That that's gonna, will just be far too expensive to make sense. Um, I also, as a, as a, on a creative note, as a fan, um, I believe it's a little bit odd to see an actor who's clearly not John Lennon open his mouth and then John Lennon's voice comes out. To me, that, that would just be weird. Um, uh, or, or let me be honest, it'll either be brilliant because you found that actor who could channel John Lennon and it was incredible. You know, it'll either be that or it'll be a, a train wreck. You know, there's no in between. Um, so, so what I would prefer to do is find um, uh, like sort of a band to and I'm a huge Beatles fan, so, I, but, so I, I don't mean this in a rude way, but kind of reinterpret to modernize the Beatles songs, like cover them faithfully, but maybe just sort of speed them up a little bit, make them a little bit more relevant. You know, to use an example of a band I worked with, like imagine Green Day doing a cover of Help, right? That, you could see that being very close to the original and having a sort of passion and, and fury to it that I think would work really well in, in the piece. I also believe that, that, you know, in what I call emotional authenticity, which to me is more important. Like when Brian saw the Beatles at the Cavern Club that night, they they were ferocious. Like, you know, when they played their own music, it, it was like like the 1960s version of punk rock. It was like, oh my God, what was that, right? And when you hear the Beatles masters, especially for young kids today, like it's not gonna feel like that. It's gonna feel like their parents' music, right? So how do I capture that feeling? You know, maybe I can do a, get, a, get somebody to do a cool cover that will have the emotional effect of what Brian heard that night. Um, so, I, so I don't know. If it was entirely up to me, that's what we would be doing. We would find a, a you know, sort of a cool, high-profile band um, to, to cover the Beatles songs. But there may be a play to, to spend the money and use the masters. I don't know. We'll see. You know, I, 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 I don't, Brian never, never answered the question, so, so I don't know. Um, he died, so yeah, well, I, well what I was going to say is for, for me, um, you know, I, part of what I love about the Beatles is I think they have so many different, uh, different styles and eras. You know, I think A Hard Day's Night is a great record, but the songs on that record are totally unlike the songs on Sgt. Pepper's. You know, how do you compare A Hard Day's Night to Strawberry Fields? Like, one is really trippy and interesting, and one is like just sort of a really driving rock pop song. Um, so I really can't, I, I'm, I really can't answer the question because I don't really have a particular one, but when I get asked this question, um, what I say is that the song that represents me the most, uh, the song that is, is closest to a mantra in life, is with a little help from my friends. Because I've been through a lot, I've lost both my folks, I've you know, had to overcome uh, expectations, and I've always done that with, with a little help from my loved ones. So that's probably the one. Um, and I will also say that, uh, that I, I have a, an affinity for a day in the life. And I suspect, uh, you know, to answer your Brian question, um, that might be the one that I would pick because in the, you know, in 1961, as I mentioned earlier, uh, you know, he gets a lot of credit for saying they're going to be bigger than Elvis. That's what everybody remembers. But I find the more interesting phrase is that they're going to elevate pop music into an art form, you know. Because at the time, everyone was like, what does that mean? What are you even talking about? And then six years later, in 1967, he pointed to Sgt. Pepper's and to A Day in the Life, and he said, that's what I meant. 
Um, so I suspect he probably had an affinity for that one because he said that's that's the proof, that's the turning pop music into an art form song. Yeah. yeah. So uh, why the meaning of graphic novel for a story that at first glance seems like it's very grounded in, in, in the real world? You yeah. Know, it's, a, it's, a, it's a medium that's generally reserved for, for the more fantastical. Sure. Right? Yeah, so, so um, when I decided that I wanted to tell the Brian Epstein story, uh, you know, the, the, the hardest first thing to, to, for me was uh, to determine how I was going to structure it. You know, I'd been studying his life for so many years, so there's so many stories I, I could tell. And as an aside, that's part of why I'm so excited to have a television miniseries, to have a six-hour palette to really get into um, so much of the, the, experience, the knowledge that I've, I've researched over the years. But at the time when I was putting a, uh, the graphic novel together, I was like, I can't, can't tell everything, right? So, um, so or, or let me say I decided I didn't want to tell everything. I wanted to keep it thin enough that, that, pe that somebody would read it who, who wasn't a huge fan who wasn't like, it's, you know, like, I'm not a huge fan, I'm not gonna read a 300 page book, 120 pages, graphic novel, finish it in two hours, you know, might give that a shot. So, so, so um, the first thing I decided was that I was gonna focus on the time he spent with the Beatles, hence the title, The Fifth Beatle. So it was gonna start in 1961 and end in 1967. So 1961, Liverpool, where the show starts, is, is that. You know, it's dark, gray, drab, rainy, a little bit depressing. You know, I viewed it as being very black and white. And the story ends in 1967 London. And I don't have a great picture here, but I can show you one when, uh, if you come out and we can flip through the book, but maybe something like that, or at least the central, central part standing across. Like 1967 London is the summer of love. It's the dawn of the psychedelic era. You know, there's literally an event in the United <coughs> Kingdom that year called a Technicolor Dream, you know? So in my mind, the arc of the Brian Epstein story mirrored the arc of the movement from black and white to color. It, from 61 to 67 was the period in the world that, that the world blossomed into color. That may not make sense to anyone other than me, um, but you can see that I was thinking in terms of color palette. Um, and you'll see that we did that. You know, it's not black and white, but it's almost, it's black, white, gray, and blue. And then by the time you get to the latter pages, like this one, or like that one, or even that to, to some extent, which is mid, and you can see in the mid pages, it's actually still sort of muted. You know, so we did do that in the graphic novel. We slowly added more and more color to it. Um, and I believe that graphic novels and film or television, the screen, are the two media that most powerfully use color as a narrative tool. Um, so those are kind of the two reasons. That's the creative reason, and, and buried into that answer was the business reason, which is that I wanted people to, to hear this story. And I kept thinking about the airport bookstore. You know, I kept thinking, like, if you could pick this up at an airport bookstore, flip through it, see the artwork's really gorgeous. I didn't do the art, I'm just the writer, so I'm not patting myself on the back. But the artwork's really beautiful. Paperback's 15 bucks, 120 pages. I could finish it in two hours before my flight lands. I may not be a huge Beatles fan, but it sounds intriguing. I might just give it a shot. You know, those are the people I wanted to reach. So there also was a, a mission-oriented reason, you know. Up here, Mary. Um, thank you for a wonderful presentation. And thank you, you. talked so wonderfully about um, your persistence, your dream, um, how hard you've worked at this. Could you say a word about luck? Uh, you know, no, it's, uh, I forget. It's, uh, I, I don't know who said it. Uh, and I, I didn't say it, but there was a, someone said, uh, you know, the, the harder I work, the better my luck gets. And that, that's what I have to say about luck. You know, I mean, uh, there's no question that the entertainment is an industry um, for which luck plays a part. Uh, there's no question about that. But, but I also believe that if you work really hard and you keep putting yourself in the right places through work, eventually you will have that lucky, that, that what looks like a lucky break, but it isn't really. It's a, wor a worked-for, well-deserved break. Um, but, but the heart of your question is, is you know, you're getting to, a, to an accurate point. I mean, the entertainment industry is a, an, an industry of tastes and changing tastes. And, you know, I, I, managed, I mentioned that I had managed bands. It was the first thing that I wanted to do. You know, I, I didn't really talk about the fact that, like, I didn't have any success with that, and I ended up shutting that down, right? And one analysis of that could be that I just didn't get lucky. You know, and, and sometimes in my head I, I go to that place and I say like, you know, because I still believe in those bands that I managed. I thought they were incredible talents and, and the people I know love them and, 
you know, but I guess they just didn't have their lucky breaks or I couldn't convince everyone else. But, you know, I'd rather just blame myself. I'd rather, yes, I think that's more useful, you know, is like complaining about having bad luck. Like, maybe I couldn't do it. Maybe I wasn't born to artist manage. You know, maybe I was born to take my love of music and put it into other mediums. Could manage a successful band, but maybe I can tell a story about the most successful manager of all time. I couldn't manage a successful punk rock band, but maybe I could take American Idiot and do something cool with that and put it on a Broadway stage. You know, so I, I just you know I, I don't look back on that and say, oh, I had bad luck. You know, I had some disappointments, um, but I never lost my faith during that period, and I just found ways to make something constructive out of what felt like a disappointment. Um, and as a quick aside, because I always feel the need to say this, when I shut down my my artist management arm, um, I kept it running probably close to a year longer than I should have, and every single band, I let them know that I'm doing this, and I helped place them at other management companies. Um, these are people's careers that I was dealing with. They're human beings, they're artists, and it's very difficult to be a, to have success as an artist. Not, not unlike your question about acting, you know, uh, act, acting and, and pursuing a musical careers are difficult, and so I felt responsible to them, and so I think if you're in a similar position where you're having disappointments and you need to shut something down, do it gracefully, you know, partially because it's the right thing to do. I believe in karma. I believe that, you know, you do the right thing and you'll get that moment of luck. You know, things, things will cycle back around. And, uh, and certainly, the entertainment industry is one of reputation. So if you do the right thing and you treat people well, that reputation will follow you. I don't know this for a fact, but I, I, I have little doubt in my mind that the reason artists like Billy Joe Armstrong of Green Day and Alanis Morissette and Paul McCartney and Ringo Starr are giving me the, the Beatles music rights have something to do with the fact that I built a good reputation for myself in the music industry. You know, and, that, and part of that was because I lost money for a year and keeping my arm alive while I placed my artist somewhere else. So that resulted in some good luck, right? But it's like you create these situations where you get that luck, you know? Well, on that night, no, um, is my sad obligation to bring tonight's conversation to a close. Um, I want to re you know, end where I started, first of all, with my deep thanks for the Rudin Foundation. Alice Eaton, Donna, thank you for being here tonight. Um, for those of you who, who came from City College community or alumni who are back here to hear this, thank you.